All right, everybody, thanks for coming out to the uh, Park Speaker Forum Series. Um, take your time out of your day, 5 o'clock on this beautiful afternoon. I know you'll probably be running around in, in the weather where it's not hot. Um, but uh, I'm Gregory Smith, so I am uh, part of the business development uh, organization here, so I help our clients sort of connect up and engage in park and, and you know, engage in our research areas and innovation and just sort of generally get access to all the good things that are happening here. Park, uh, as you're aware, has been around for a long time. We're just short of our 50th anniversary. It was very exciting. Um, you're doing a lot of breakthrough innovation, and you know we really translate science and research into technology and things that people can use. And um, this Park Forum series, I guess we've been doing it about 40 years now, and we really like to bring in you know advanced thinkers and people that are sort of moving and shaking, and amazing people like David, who we've uh, asked to come in and talk to you today a little bit. A uh, couple housekeeping issues. So, if you're not signed up for the Park Forum um, uh, newsletter, so you know, go ahead and sign up. There's some people up, uh, they'll take your names, your emails up top. There's also the Park Newsletter, which kind of talks about what we're doing around partnerships and some of the latest research and innovations we're doing. Feel free to sign up for that as well. And uh, thirdly, if you're using any social media, we encourage that and uh, ask you to try to use the uh, hashtag Park Forum with any of your posts. So with that, let's get to the main event. And uh, so uh, David Henkel Wallace, founder of Leela AI, an AI research company building general semantic AI agents to work alongside humans. His 25 year career as a technical company founder in Silicon Valley has spanned software, pharmaceuticals, and power generation. Prior to becoming an entrepreneur, he worked in research labs such as the MIT AI lab, CMRI in Paris. He did a little stint here in Park, just probably not too far from that door right there and uh, MCC Psych Project. So uh, without further ado, David, thanks for coming and uh, looking forward to what you have to say. Hi. Good. <clears throat> well, as Greg said, I'm David Henkel Wallace, and I'm gonna be talking about a semantic intelligent agent. Now, those three words are often misused, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna go through what, I mean, what we mean by that. Uh, typically, when you give a technical talk like this, you start with uh, a description of your technology uh, and then how it could be used and why you should care. But in this case, I'm actually going to start with why we're bu building Leela. And this we, I'm not the founder of Leela, I am a founder of Leela. There were five of us. Uh, then I'll actually talk about what Leela is, why she's an agent, uh, what, I mean, what we mean by semantic, intelligent, and agent. And then I'll, then I'll dive in a little bit to uh, how she works. We've got about 45 minutes, so I won't do a super deep dive, but we've got plenty of time afterwards to talk. So before I begin, I should say Leela is a small research company. There's a half a dozen of us, um, <clears throat> give or take, depending on time. Uh, majority of us come from the MIT AI lab in the uh, Papert and Minsky eras, the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and even though we're a little research group, we're busy writing code. We haven't been publishing, not because we have anything against publishing, we've just been too busy writing code. And you'll see some of the results running uh, here on the screen today. Uh, we've been working self-funded all out of our homes. We recently raised a little money, so we're actually using this as our, doing this now as our, as our day job. Feel free to hand, hand checks on the way out to augment our seed round. <laughs> So why are we doing this? I mean, the first question is nobody trusts complex machines, right? Uh, I think we've all seen these adversarial examples um, of uh, my favorite is the soccer ball and the school bus. Because um, you can kind of look at them and kind of figure out why they're wrong, right? Uh, and yet how it went wrong. Uh, Siri and all of those voice assistants are a source of humor. I mean, a lot of people depend on them, but I, I love this one, you know? I'm bleeding really bad. Can you call me an ambulance? OK, from now on, I'll call you an ambulance. <laughs> right? and, and the most common kind of robots that we use, you know, these assembly robots, they're always screened off by humans, right? whether it's an Amazon warehouse or, or a car factory, like I think this picture is from a car factory. Uh, we keep people away from them. In fact, the robot that most people come in contact with on a routine basis is the elevator. That's the most sophisticated robot that anybody ever gets to use. And this is kind of absurd. Right? We need machines that will actually work with us so that we can interact with or that will interact with us. And that robot or even the elevator doesn't interact with us. Um, 
One reason, one kind of, of interaction, of course, is self-driving cars. And uh, you know, here's a great case where if I were driving across this bridge, sorry, if I were approaching this bridge, I think any person in this room with a driving license would say, I'm not going to drive across that bridge. Right? But you've got what appears to your navigation system as an exogenous factor here. Right? And I can recognize that might be part of the bridge. So I'm not going to drive, uh, drive across. I need to have some kind of comprehension, you know, holistic comprehension, or when I say comprehension, I mean semantic understanding uh, of the situation. Um, and I have to be able to make dynamic decisions. And a lot of the systems, you know, what are called AI systems today, they're really rifle shots. And they exhibit tunnel vision, to mix, mix metaphors here. You know, you're going to, I'm going to just segment the environment, and then someone's going to write a program by hand to take the, uh, to take the results. And, and, uh, and do some planning. And this important state not being visible, covert state or, or implicit state, makes it impossible to answer really interesting questions. Okay. You can say, is there a cyclist in this picture? Is there a photographer in this picture? Now we can do excellent segmentation and probably count the number of, of, of cyclists in the picture. But to ask a really deeper question, is somebody in danger, really needs to recover, needs needs an understanding of what's going on with this guy. And actually, this guy looks like he's in danger too. right? And, and that state that you have to have and bring to the analysis, no number of training examples is going to, is going to uh, train a system for this random picture that might happen to come up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the same use of exogenous data or covert data state uh, is crucial for understanding a Wikipedia entry. You know, when I was on the psych project, one of our favorite examples was uh, to, to speculate on at the time I was there, we couldn't answer this question, was uh, Wellington was sad to hear of Napoleon's death. Now, what a great question. I mean, they, they were, the psych could represent that they were enemies, that they lived over a coextensional period of time, but why would someone tell him when Napoleon had died? And what was, why would he feel fear? feel sadness. All of those things are implicit in articles in Wikipedia, whether they're about um, physics or the Napoleonic Wars um, or any other activity of human, of, of any other uh, subject actually on the Wikipedia. So you need a system that doesn't have, that doesn't require all its state to be overt, but has the idea of, of why you might want to bring meaning to the interpretation of what you're looking at. And the final thing you need for systems to, to provide, not how to implement, to provide for systems uh, that are going to work with people is explanation. And the explanation, of course, is for credibility. I put that at the bottom. People are always going to say, well, why did you do that? Right? And that's the, like the curse of the computer user for the last 30 years. Why did you do that? But the other thing is um, the only way to debug a complex system is actually to ask it about itself. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how Leela, later in the talk about how Leela uses language and where the language comes from. So what you need is abstraction, automation, and a toolkit. And we'll talk about how those things work. Or, what I mean by that, <clears throat> this picture I took on the way to a hospital. I was in a hurry. I came back and took the picture on the way home. Um, and I was, I was zipping down. I saw the sign out of the corner of my eye, and I made a left-hand turn. Right. I didn't even think twice about it. I don't think I even noticed at the first time I went to the hospital. That's what I did. And uh, someone who's not in this room but was the founder of a large automotive, uh, autonomous car project said, actually said to me, well, that's not a problem because we will have seen everything. <laughs> you know, that's a very, it's, it's a very popular belief, right? We will have seen everything. And I'm like, well, how often do you seen, see this slide? Because I'm sure everybody in this room knows why this slide is upside down. Right? And he said, oh, well, we just put a convolutional, you know, we use a convolutional network on for, for recognition. So it's rotation invariant. Well, that doesn't really answer the question, does it? Um, you can't plan for everything. This is the famous Tesla case. It's a little gruesome, so I think everybody knows the Tesla case, right? So I, it's gruesome enough. And here's the other problem. When you use a neural network to examine the entire possibility space, you can attack a problem that's combinatorially complex. This picture um, is actually from beside the road in India. I've seen this, actually. Someone just takes an engine apart. Right? And nobody tries every possible combination of assembling 
engine parts to put the engine back together, right? Oh, well, shall I take the manifold and put the nut here, or shall I put the nut here? No, they have a sense of hierarchy. They have a model of what they're trying to accomplish, and they know about trial and error, directed trial and error that converges to be able to put something that, you know, every part of that was part of an engine at one time, so they must go back together. So those are the class of problems that we want to solve. Now, what is Leela to put that? What are the core elements of Leela that we focused on working on to try and solve these questions? So the first thing is common sense. I spent a lot of time on psych project worrying about common sense. Common sense is all that knowledge that we don't actually write down. That's why it's common. We've all got it. Why have we got it? Because we've got it through experience, our own experiences. We see them from other people. We've gathered it incrementally. And we don't ever try to write it down. And the projects that have tried to write it down have foundered because nobody really knows it until they see it, and because it's arbitrarily large and highly domain specific or socially specific. But every to get around the uncanny value of using a robot, the very reason why we put them inside cages, we have to exhibit the same kind of, we have to meet the expectations of the people that it's working with. Like, I just want to believe that, you know, Greg's not going to take his hand and just swing out and whack me um, because I'm just, I know how people behave, right? And I, I, I know the distance away that he is. Um, and we need to expect that our robots or other systems that we use will exhibit that same kind of behavior. Um, Leela, as I'll talk about it later, acquires the knowledge through exploration herself. She does exploration of her world and experimentation within her world to learn how the world behaves. She builds a big piece of graph structure that is potentially inscrutable to me, to a human, to, 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 to read, but exhibits the proper kind of behavior and assumptions that we have. Second thing is that she's a continuous learning system. There is no mode between training and operation, which is a property that humans have as well. Right? The better, more she does something, Hopefully, the better she gets at the better she gets at it because she starts to build increasingly abstract representations of her of, of her tasks. So, tasks that in traditional artificial intelligence, I'm not talking about today's neural network worlds, but AI from the 80s and 90s, often treated planning, learning, hypothesis, making hypotheses if people could really even do that, explanation, and then execution as as disjoint tasks. You read different books to learn about these different subjects. And yet, they're actually tightly related programs that operate in a loop. You're continually planning. I'm planning, oh, how shall I, what metaphor shall I use here? And as I do it, I see people nod or not. I have this interactive process that allows me to execute properly. Leela does the same thing. That ability means she has greater resilience and not the brutalness that you saw in the adversarial vision networks because she can fall back on simpler models, additional data that she has. And language, that was one of the interesting things that we didn't realize at first. But language is actually also part of how the system needs to learn, how she works. So her, la her, her language acquisition is tightly integrated with her learning mechanism, but it is also part of how she learns concepts. So um, our goal to just cl clarify why we care, you know, we looked at, I looked at neural networks. And my parents are aging, and I've just moved them into a home. And, and there's a lot of products to detect a fall and call, you know, Apple Watch, right? Oh, I fell down, call the, call the hospital. And fall detection and prediction with neural networks will tell you within half a second whether the person's about to fall, which is a bit too late. It's like being a management consultant. They told you something you already knew, and you can't take action on it, right? What you really need to know is understand the local environment learn specifically for the person, oh, look, there's something on the floor that I think you're moving in the direction of. That is dangerous. Be careful. You're walking out of the house, and it's cold. I know the weather. That it's cold. You're not wearing a jacket. You need to predict the problems and make them not happen. Agency. So why is Leela an agent? That means Leela is not a, just a program that you run. It's not a, there's not some magic Leela algorithm that could be re-implemented. I mean, you could write the code over, of course. But that doesn't refer to it. Leela actually explores her world. I'll show you some videos a little bit later for uh, exploring some sandboxes. And she builds her model through experimentation. And if her experiments succeed, then as her probability becomes higher, OK, then I'm going to know that. So she starts out knowing nothing. When you boot her up, 
She just has sensory motor capabilities. She can move her hands. Uh, she can see. She can move her eyes. And she starts to build correlations. Oh, I see. When I move my hand, I see something in my vision. I wonder if I move it up, will I see something move up? Or if I move my eye and I'm not moving my hand, it seems to move. And she starts to learn how her body works. And that set of mechanisms, as she builds increasing abstractions, she can start to learn more abstract ideas. Like, I need something to be higher than something else. And I've learned ways to make you know, blocks higher than something else. So if I need to reach something high on a shelf, I need to make myself higher. What kind of plan can I do to that? Um, she has a hypothetical thinking. Um, ultimately, I hope if we have a robot, Leela, she'll know not to jump off a cliff just because everyone else is. Um, and, uh, and she can provide an explanation. So she's more than just a neural network. Um, I'm going to jump down here for a second. She's model, Leela's learning model is based on developmental psychologist Jean Piaget, who, by the way, was Seymour Papert's PhD advisor. Um, we're guided by what humans do, but not how. That's because, you know, I've got a 100 hertz, 80 giga node piece of hardware up here with a 10 to the fifth fan out. I can't buy anything like that. I only know one way to make those, uh, and hard to program. But so we're not trying to say, okay, like the Numenta guys, model the human brain. But we are trying to say, what behaviors do humans exhibit? And can we make a machine, can we take advantage of those behaviors to learn in useful ways that people can, people can interact with? Um, and so to do that, we built a model based on functional semantics. That means instead of having training a neural network to recognize a cat in a picture, or a cat in the scene, or a cat when you touch it, um, those, the definition of what comes out to a cat is an emergent phenomenon. And you actually see this in humans, right? We, give our kids these little pictures that actually don't look anything like cats. But they emphasize elements of, of, that are important for catness. And the kids are able to learn cat-like behavior, you know, what, what, what socially constitutes a cat, which is really all that matters for a cat, by using these kinds of cartoon examples, telling stories, and also interacting, I hope, with real cats. Um, and, and, and what comes out of that is, uh, and I have, I have some slides, the next slides will talk about that, the emergent behavior of what constitutes um, a cat. Or this cat or meatloaf, a friend of mine is writing a textbook, so he was, he was trying to figure out how to do cat or meatloaf detection. And he wrote a neural network to detect pictures of cats and pictures of meat meatloafs. But the fact is, I make, a very different, I make a very decision of what's a cat. I use very different criteria for what's a cat. And if I see a meatloaf out in the garden while I'm walking around, I probably won't recognize it at first because it doesn't satisfy my constraints of what I'm supposed to see. Um, I'll skip that. So what do I mean when I say it comes out of the definition of what, say, a chair comes out of a, an emergent set of, of, of behavioral schemas? So fundamental, one of the fundamental representations in the system is a schema that correlates pre-state and post-state with an action that happens that probabilistically uh, suggests that if you take that action, that this other result will happen. So if I see, a, I see this cup in front of me, it's close enough for me to reach, and I push my hand forward, I'll touch it. Or if I push my hand too far, it'll, it'll fall over. And that's really not a property that's specific to cups. And so as Leela learns, I'll show you some video a little bit later, she starts to learn, oh, actually, that's a more general rule for physical objects that I, that I can actually see. Um, and so, one of the examples we like to use here is that you know, we're all sitting in chairs. And, uh, and if, I, if I get tired, I'm going to sit down on a chair. Uh, but if I'm out in the woods and I'm feeling tired, and I ask my robot to find me something to sit on, well, there aren't any chairs. And so using a chair perceptron is not going to help me in the woods. And yet, if you have a model, well, he wants to sit, and therefore you need something about you know, this wide for his bottom and about this high, then, uh, oh, well, here's a tree stump. And, um, and so it can, use, it can use things it knows about the activity of trying to sit and make a plan, sort of requirements of trying to sit, and find different ways to satisfy that plan. And then says, oh, well, you know, a tree stump actually, a tree stump might actually work. So how, how, does, uh, how does Leela actually do this? 
see if this video works. So she starts out with no knowledge, as I said, in this video. Um, and she explores like uh, a human child, she explores the world. I think this video is just a 2D grid world. And so she begins by just randomly, just like a child does, randomly moving her hand around, uh, crashing into things, they get moved along. And this little visualizer starts out by saying, well, I don't know anything, so I've just got this root node, essentially my graph structure. But as she starts to find things, she starts to spin off more specialized or more predictive behavior based on actions that she takes. And what's interesting about these nodes is they tend to cluster around, there's a force directed graph, nothing super magic about it, but they cluster around core conceptual ideas um, like, I don't know, this is, not, this is just a video so I can't mouse over it, but let's just say um, I, have a, I have a series of uh, schemas relating to uh, things that happen when I'm feeling something tactilely in the front of my hand. Well, start, she starts to learn more specific cases, you know, where that's, I have, I have one that says, well, if I see something and I, and I feel something in front of my hand, then there's probably, a, I can actually move my eye and see it. Um, so these, and the nice thing about these nodes is since, since they're hierarchical, and the hierarchy is not imposed, but the hierarchy is generated through operation, they can actually start to give, um, you get predictive value, and the great thing is if, if your predictive schema is not satisfied, you can generalize. You say, well, maybe I need to, 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 to take a more general path to figure that out. Um, now, the nice thing is, here's Leela actually trying. Now we're actually telling her to do something. Now she's explored the world. She's only built around 8,000 of these schemas. And we want to tell her to move from here to there. So the first time she tries, it doesn't work. She can't move through that cylinder. So now she tries a new plan, and she gets around. That right there, 1980s planner, right? State of the art 1980s. But the nice thing is, OK, so she hasn't yet learned that um, the situation is different. And um, that, by the way, is, uh, is a canonical problem of sheep. I don't know if you've ever seen sheep in Australia. They, you see acres of sheep running, and then one of them will trip for some funny reason, and then for a while, for the next 10 or 15 minutes, every sheep right behind it will jump in the same spot, right? Because, oh, that's a good heuristic, and until one of them forgets, and then the, and then, and then the wave damps out. Um, so uh, as, as now another 10,000 clock cycles, she's explored some more, and now she can make a plan, a new plan, that says, oh, I can do a more efficient thing if I don't see anything in the way. Okay, that's pretty quick. I mean, that's like, we're talking five minutes on a laptop to do this kind of analysis. No, you know, pretty, pretty fast. And, um, and if you put it in, she still has retained her ability. She hasn't like magically learned that it doesn't work. She's, she hasn't lost her knowledge or overridden her knowledge. Her plan to go through would no longer succeed because she could see something. Oh, well, I'll fall back on a plan that can handle that. And um, this picture, there's a little bit, this is, this is, again, her, her trying to, to learn. Let me skip forward a little. Um, so this is the same blocks, basically the same, same blocks world. But the interesting fun thing to notice on this picture is that as she does, as, as she explores the world, um, she actually learns the same way human beings do. This is un unsupervised learning here. Um, so. This is some woman who posted her nanny cam on, on, on YouTube. And uh, so you see the same sort of thing, right? That uh, Leela tries this block, and then she tries over here, and she tries over there. And the baby does the same thing, picks up thing, rolls that, picks this, drops it a few times. She's got a heuristic to repeat what she does, but gets very rapidly bored and gives on to the next thing. And interestingly enough, she gets bored after five tries, and Leela found that actually five tries was statistically significant for her, too. Probably an implementation coincidence, but. Uh, I love, I love the idea that it might be the same as a human. Um, so do I want to show some verbal commands? Yeah. yeah, I have time to do that. Um, so Lila uses language, which is a mechanism I'll talk about in a few minutes. But you know, language is the, is the best way to interact with her. Um, in the early days, I think this video just shows us typing, you know, selecting the selecting language. I got to say her language is not as rich as English. It's just a subject verb object. 
uh, for now. Um, but uh, it uses the fundamental schemas of the system. So here we're saying touch the pointy block with your hand, which is this blue robot hand here. So she figured out how to touch her. Block touch, moving pointy hand right, left. So she explained that I had to move my hand down and then move it left to see the thing that I saw. Now we give her a more vague command. She's never, no one's ever programmed in top right corner. She has a teacher, I'll talk about them, who actually speaks to her, just like as parents we speak to the children and narrates the world in a, in a very small vocabulary right now. And so she's actually learned that top right corner is not, is, is disambiguated from right or left, but is a, is a place, is a place to go. She has no concept built into the language system of prepositions or location or anything like that. And so when we run it, um, when we step around, she's like, oh, okay, I know how to go up there, and then I can explain that. Block hand, right, moving, touch pointy top. Okay. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you want to see, I could tell you, I, you could see her actually saying my plan, my plan failed as well. And so I just sold it in her plan. But I want to show you something more interesting here. So um, we are planning to build robots. And robots are, um, in the more general sense, robots. And one of the nice things about robots is, um, I mean, you could build a, something, an Android-shaped thing that walks around and moves, around and, and, and moves through space. But in uh, the IoT world, and especially in uh, Japan, where people love to shove every kind of IoT um, object in their, in their house, um, your house can be your robot because you have a variety of cameras and sensors and other ambient, ambient detectors in your environment. Well, Leela starts out, first of all, working these play pens, and then she starts moving through simulated, uh, simulated homes. Um, but people add new senses. So this is an experiment we did not so long ago where Leela started out rigidly coupled to the table, so she could just move around the table and move around in three space. And we started to give her new commands, new physical capabilities like rotation and walking around. And you know, the theory says that Leela should be able to handle that just fine, but you know, we scheduled a lot of time to make that work because programs are all full of bugs. But in fact, the same Leela program and database that had been trained without the ability to move, when she now connected to a physics world that actually had the ability to rotate and move, she could actually move. And she sees She's got new kinds of capabilities, rotate right and move, you know, left. she's already had move left and move right, and now she can rotate, and she's actually able to use those and build new sets of schema that can incorporate these new actions. And uh, the next step we want to do is I'll do the same with new kinds of uh, input senses, you know, maybe a depth camera or just a new, uh, a new webcam. And if you, you know, I mean, if I, I personally as a human, I'm not sure that I can ever if I were given a third arm, I would, I would ever develop the skill to actually use it for the facility. But Leela actually uh, has, well, she has the time. You know, she could just run overnight. But she has the time to actually, and the ability to learn new senses and, and new, uh, new effectors. And, uh, and I think that's going to give her a lot, of cap a lot of capability that we don't have today. So what's the language training architecture? Like I said, we have a second agent we call the teacher. Well, I like to think of it as the parent, because you know, when you have a kid, you're continually narrating the world nonstop. Um, this program looks at the internal state of the physics world and narrates what's going on in the physics world with a very, uh, at the moment, very limited vocabulary. Um, and uh, pardon me, uses a set of heuristics to craft utterances. That just says she looks at the state and figures out what to say. Um, and they're all based on what Leela has in the world, right? You're touching a ball, or uh, there's, an apple, there's an apple on the table, or a dish on the counter. And, and, and this, is, this is pretty important. I'll have a slide about this further. It's not just that it's what's in the world, and that's what's in our sensor. It's that all of our, converse, all of our discussions and our metaphors that we use are based on items in the world. So we want Leela to start out with her foundational linguistic knowledge to come from what's actually in the world. Um, once the, um, so there's a typo that's thrown me off here. 
Um, Lili uses discrimination. Let me get the slide uh, on the next one. Yeah, to decide. So she decided, but OK, I'll go on to the next slide, actually. Um, so the important thing is that she, doesn't, she builds her own correlations. And more importantly, she tries to build her own discrimination. So most of the systems, Google Translate, most of the, most of the modern uh, natural, land, natural language understanding programs use word vectors, right? Word to vec is the most famous. Where you look, f you look at a big corpus, and then you try to find the words that are most commonly used together, bread and butter, OK? Duck and moral mushrooms. And, um, and Leela doesn't do that. Remember, Leela doesn't start out with a, with a preconceived model. And she builds an emergent model. And so what she does is that she hears these words, like we had upper right corner. Well, the word right is used in a lot of different contexts. Right? This is to the right of that. You need to move to the right. Upper is a, is a distance or the far left corner. Um, and yet, the idea, and the idea of corner, well, there's four of them in a square room. So how can you use that word uh, in an ambiguous way? Well, Leela, Leela finds bindings for what those you know, two other schema, two physical schemas that characterize uh, the meaning of the word in that given context. So she really looks for ways to split rather than conjoin uh, the meanings of words. Um, but the same mechanisms that she used to build her, her knowledge representation of language is the same mechanisms that are used to figure out that, oh, you want to sit, I'm going to sit on a stump. There's not a special language module that has uh, extraordinarily special reasoning. And uh, I think I have a video of this, maybe in one of my slides, that she can quickly add linguistic concepts that she hasn't seen before. So for example, um, she can say, oh, you can, you can show her a, a a pink cylinder and a red cylinder and a blue block. And she doesn't know what those are, but she can just ask a question, right? It's one of her I.O. systems. Oh, is this, is this blue? Or she can pick up the red cylinder. Is this blue? And she starts to say, where does it not actually match? And help that use, use that to figure out what the words mean. Um, and therefore, she can actually then, if she's never seen uh, a pink block, but she knows now what pink means, and she knows the difference between blocks and cylinders, you put one in the, in the, on the in her in her playpen, and she'll say, "Oh, what you say? What is that?" She'll say, "That's a pink block." Okay. Uh, areas we want to go because that's where I meant. She can actually ask. That's why language is actual I/O, just like like any other uh, sensory motor system. But looking ahead for us, you know, since Leela doesn't have a correlational mechanism that actually matches the use of language to achieve goals that are embedded within the, o the overall representation system. Uh, if you teach her a completely different language, we believe she will just build completely different bindings or appropriate bindings. So that languages you know, like Russian, where you don't have the word blue, but you have different words that both represent blue, she'll learn those bindings without trying to necessarily start with English as a basis. And then when you want to have her generate a sentence in a given language, she should be able to generate it appropriately to the semantics of the language of the human language she's using. So we think in the long term, this should give much better translation than you get by trying to use statistical correlations between languages, where the most interesting thing about speaking different human languages is how they don't correlate. Um, so this is an example we're working on. We were using a, a green cylinder, but green papaya is just as good. Um, you know, she's never seen a green papaya before. She's only seen orange papayas. But you could say, what is this thing? Oh, it's a papaya. Well, this is, I should have had a better slide here. This is going to activate a whole bunch of papaya-related schemas. But when he says, it's delicious, he's like, oh, OK, so I can eat this thing. But her learning process is not, doesn't just exist in some kind of linguistic plane, abstract linguistic plane. You know, right now, like, we have neural networks for looking at photographs and neural networks for analyzing language. She's going to use all her senses and everything she knows about the physical world to, to correlate with the utterance that this is a papaya. Right? She's going to touch it. She can touch it and see it, correlate that. I see it, or I can make a plan to go touch it, add that to my knowledge about this new thing that I'm just being told about. So here's an ambiguous command that I was talking about, Leela being given. Look, thing, center. So here's a case okay. where. She says, OK. 
you were, put, get your hand into the middle of your fovea. That's a pretty useful heuristic, by the way, for almost anything you do. Hand move back right bottom, seeing look. So here in this case, she, um, she has two different ways to do that, right? She can move her hand, or actually a lot of ways. She can move her hand into the middle of her fovea, or she can move her fovea so that her hand is centered on it, or some combination of the two. And so she just picked one that she felt was the least amount of effort, and then she was able to explain the plan she took. And actually, uh, I don't have it on this video, but she can actually explain why she chose that particular plan. And um, let's see. So why do we have an agent? Right? I spent several years of my life working on a psych project. This is, took this out of an old slide of mine from 30 years ago. Um, you know, we went through we went through neural networks. I went through expert systems, right? Curation. We're going to capture the knowledge, and that's all we need to do to make decisions. Didn't scale. You know, these ontological corpora, you know, CommonSnet, you know, SenseNet, and Psych, uh, they don't scale, and because different people are entering them, the they generate islands of knowledge that are disjoint. And it's all the stuff that we do talk about. So it's like the very stuff that you don't really want to have. Right? I mean, they're useful for bootstrapping certain processes, but they don't really teach you anything about, sense, about, um, about common sense. Deep learning, you know, the problem is you've still got to program the system by how you organize your net and how you choose your training set. And it doesn't, no one's really gotten an architecture that allows you to pull back and have the ambiguity of being able to use portions of your network that are appropriate to the task you're trying to solve. And so we let, we don't try to do it by hand. We've decided that hand, hand development is too hard. We're going to write some software, but we're going to allow Leela to explore through her environment the set of schemes that she thinks are most important to, to produce and how to make them happen. And um, because when you do it by hand, you know, you can build a machine that's still better than a human at some things, and yet, I, I love, this is my favorite, is the, uh, the engine on the governor, right? No human can keep the speed of, do speed regulation by hand on a steam engine, and yet, it's also the most stupid, it's both the most human exceeding de device, and yet it's also the most stupid device. So when I talk about scale, and scale and abstraction, here's an example that we pulled out. This is an OpenAI uh, <clears throat> grid world navigation problem. And we use OpenAI's uh, neural network solutions versus Leela exploring in the way that we've said. And you know, here's a 30 by 30 world and a 40 by 40 world. This is just a standard OpenAI demo you can run yourself. And not surprisingly, because the neural networks need to explore the space and have no, exhaustively and don't have a sense of composition, well, scales up you know quadratically with the size of your, of your search space. That, that shouldn't be any surprise. And yet Leela, who builds abstraction, does much better than linearly. Now, if you were writing the program by hand, if you're any kind of programmer, you're going to do this, right? Nobody's going to do the exhaustive search. But this is the reason why you can't put the engine back together. With a, neur a neural network-based planner is never going to be able to put that engine back together because the space you know, space is way out there on the complexity side, and it's growing exponentially. You need a sense of abstraction. You need a sense of scale. And that's what this compositional architecture of Leela provides. So ultimately, this is where we want to end up on well, my slide, which is when my dad picks up the newspaper, because he still reads the web on mushed up trees, I want Leela to tell him to know, have enough model of him to say, hey, you left your glasses in the bathroom. Because that's, you know, that's where our spouses do for each other. And I'm not planning on replacing spouses. But you know, that's the kind of, that's, that's a machine that actually understands me, understands what I'm doing, and understands what I need. And that's the best kind of companion to have. So there we go. All right. And we can dive arbitrarily on the techni technology, technology, by the way. I was asked to keep this very high level. Thank you, David. All right, thank you very much for that. So uh, let's open the floor up to some questions. We have a very quick hand here in the back. I don't know if uh, I may be here by myself, so I'm going to run. Thank you so much. 
Um, is it possible to assign a particular maturity age to Leela? If so, what age do you think she is? And, and the, the follow-up question is, why do you assign a pronoun and why is it female? Uh, this is a serious question around ethics, actually. Why do I sign, uh, I miss, why do I sign something and why is it female? What was the? F What's the age do you think it is and why use a female name? Oh, uh, why is Leela female? Um, two reasons, one of which is uh, Leela is not just a Sanskrit word, but it's actually a name. It's my aunt's name, although I didn't choose the name. And uh, so I always think of her as female. But more than that, people always say he. Like, why is always machine he? We thought it might be nicer for our robot to be a she. Um, so there was no philosophical reason for that. Just that's what we wanted. Uh, now, to pick her age, um, do I have a... I think I have a, might have a slide on this topic. I don't have uh, Piaget's uh, sensory motor scale. Um, but anyway, uh, Leela has the idea of um, object persistence. That's one of the recent developments. That's where I can put something down, for example, and not see it, and still make a plan that takes into account. Also, Leela can make, a, make an experiment to verify that, right? So let's say I, uh, I want to touch the microphone, but I remember that I might have put, there might be a cup on the counter. Leela can make an experiment. Reach out slowly, and if you touch it, don't, you know, don't push. Oh, OK, it's still there. Or she can just make a plan, right? Uh, I'm thirsty, and there's Greg's water, but I know there's a glass closer to me. So she has the idea of having state that is out of, out of the vision, and that uh, Piaget says, uh, develops at his sensory motor stage four, that is around 14 months. Now, a real 14 month year old has a lot of other skills that Leela doesn't have, right? Can kind of wobble around and utter a few more interesting sentences and whatever. But in terms of, uh, of developing these higher level cognitive tasks, um, you could say she's about 14 months old. Uh, let's do one over there. Oh. Okay. So maybe related to this question, I'm not sure. Do you have the sense of uh, how far you are from accomplishing a real task that's simple? Like, for example, there's lots of uh, talk about having maybe a robot for seniors, where someone could tell the robot, go to the other room and fetch me my glasses, okay, that, I, that are on the table. How, how far are you from that? Well, uh, we're far enough away that's probably not going to help my parents, but I hope it helps me. Because um, we think about this problem a lot. I mean, you want to be able to answer ambiguous sentences like, uh, if your robot makes you an egg, and you would say, ah, oh, that egg was too dry. Don't make it a little runnier, but not so runny like that one you made last week, right? Um, or maybe simpler problems like finding dangerous things on the floor or noticing that you forgot to take your pills. Um, one of our investors is a, a, a big uh, Japanese company who is building a lot of these systems with uh, IoT, IoT systems in the houses. So that's one of the reasons why we started working on that particular problem. Um, and we're looking for sort of early, we're still in R, haven't really gotten to D, um, but we are looking for problem domains that, like that, that are, uh, that are simpler, simpler to discover, um, simpler, simpler, to, simpler to solve. Uh, just a quick question. Do you view this equilibrium as static or dynamic? Do I view which is static or dynamic? Equilibrium, you say, in point three. Oh, um, that's a good question. How do I want to answer that? Um, I, have a clear, I have a clear picture. I'm just trying to create the right mental states in your head that match mine. No, what happens is that Leela Leela builds these, like I said, she builds these schemas that relate world states, transitions in world states, and, and causative elements of transitions in world states. And if they're very successful, that is, they turn out to be true, whether she wanted to do or do so or not. You know, whether I let a ball and watch it roll down, or somebody else let the ball and watch it roll down. I, I, either way, I'm going to learn that balls roll when I let go. So as their stability, as as they become more reliable, she will, of course, depend on them more. Just as a neural network, if the node has a very high weight, it's going to act. You know, it's going to be it's going to be trusted. 
But what Leela has, so you could say that each of these little nodes has a certain amount of stable equilibrium through its experiment. But what's different about Leela is that the node she might choose to use as part of her plan may not be that most, might not be that one that you think is highest value because she's like, oh, in this situation, I don't believe it's as state, it's as accurate. It's not epistemologically adequately grounded for this particular situation. So I will choose something, quote unquote, less reliable, but I think is more reliable for this particular situation. May I suggest just to compromise? Yeah. Call it dynamic stability. Dynamic stability. All right. Because The model is continually being revised at every action. Dynamic. OK, that's a, that might have even been what, what Piaget was thinking when he wrote that. OK, Hewitt. Yeah, hello there. What exactly is a schema, and how are they used? Uh, a schema, uh, let's see if I can draw. Can't really draw here. Um, this is just, this, I mean, it's a schema, right? Any kind of data schema. In this case, it relates a state vector to a state vector that's like currently true, currently applicable, right? Like uh, I'm in a room with a bunch of people in the room um, to uh, another state vector. Let's say I'm in the same room, but there are no people in the room. So what action could I take to, do I have an action that will cause all of you to flee? Um, and uh, that's, that's all that a schema is at, at itself. But then along with it are uh, a set of statistics that say, uh, how often was this applicable? Right? How often was I in a room with a lot of people? And uh, if, if this action were taken by me or by Greg or by anyone, uh, did, I get that, did that result take place? So um, the schema itself is, I mean, it's a static relationship. But the statistics collection is continuous and is dynamic. But it, in and of itself, is inert, right? Because it's essentially invariant. Uh, but the planners use them. And the planners consult these reliability statistics. And what happens is you start to chain them together to implement plans. And you say, well, I know that if I um, want my, you know, I, 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 I want my. Uh, ball to be on the floor and it's in my pocket. I've got to have a situation where uh, I've got to have it on my hand. And then I notice there's always a situation where my ball is in my hand where I can actually put it on the floor. So then that starts to build these chains, which themselves have, prob you know, have probabilistic um, uh, predictive capability. And then the planner, can, the planner generates those, and, then planner, you know, and the planner then can consult those to say, are these good candidates to different kinds of planners, or multiple planners, can consult those to decide whether they're s s believable enough to be worth giving a try. That answer? Yeah. How is Psych doing these days? A good question. I don't really know. They <laughs> seem to have a little money. They seem to have stopped working with pharma companies, and they seem to stop working with DARPA, but um, uh, you know, they're still plugging at it, was it like 30 years on? Um, it's uh, amazing to me. I, uh, I don't regret my time there, but I certainly don't regret leaving. <laughs> yeah, so the um, uh, narrator agent is obviously critical for Leela to learn. So how did you create the narrator agent? Uh, the narrator agent right now is um, pretty brute force. First of all, we start with a real, at the moment we have very restrictive vocabulary, although as we go down the road this year, we'll be expanding that. Um, but the narrator is tightly coupled to the physics system. And although Leela herself can plug into a bunch of physics systems, not all of them have enough. We don't, not all of them, for not all of them do we have a module which can tell the, tell the teacher what, what she needs to, to say. It's, it's, uh, you could say it's not really cheating because Leela doesn't have access to what's going on in the physics system. But it's, you know, it's like when you're teaching your child, right? You're like, oh, where are we going to pick up the ball? And, and we haven't got wired in yet to the, the point which I really like, which is where when you have the kid and you pick up the ball, 
you put it, you know, you, you know, you're saying, oh, it's the bowl, you put it on the counter, you know, you can think, no, 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 hold it this way. It's not that sophisticated yet. It's explicitly programmed to understand the physics system. Uh, you know, that would be its own line of research. Um, we would rather just use Turkers to do it, actually, or something like that, um, because humans, they're less predictable. But, you know, Leela's too primitive at the moment for that. Um. We have a question back here. Like, let's say that Leela's in her 3D virtual world, and she bumps into, like, a refrigerator. And so she relates that the refrigerator is a solid object and she can't go through it. So next run, she avoids the refrigerator, but she bumps into like a cabinet. Does she have to bump into every single object to realize that she can't go through them? That's an excellent question. Really good question. So um, I'll just rephrase that question. Okay. So Leela has learned, Leela begins by learning everything uh, from kind of ground zero. Okay, so I use the example of moving her hand. Now, she has what's called uh, proprioception. She knows where her hand is, just like we do. So she learns that if I'm looking this way and I see something, you know, put my hand here, I'll see something. She only learns that through experimentation. And then completely separately, she learns if I move my eye a little bit and I have my hand here, I'll see something at that part of my vision, right? So her early ground vision, that's why when we're talking about the first few thousand schemas that Leela had created. When she's only created a couple of thousand schemas, it's all these very, very simple relationships. But using the mechanism that I was talking to Carl Hewitt about, as she starts to learn more generally, she starts to realize that, oh, every time I touch something, wherever it happens to be, if I feel it in the front of my hand, uh, I can't move forward, let's say. She's in a world where everything's fixed, like your refrigerator and your cabinet. So then when she sees something new that satisfies that rule, like she's touching the cabinet, she won't try to walk in that direction, even though she might never have seen that cabinet before. Because she's got a rule already that says, which she has learned on her own, is reliable, that when I'm touching something, I can't walk through it. So uh, my, my, my colleague Cyrus, who does the language, actually, by the way, uh, wanted me to mentioned part of this embodiment, the fact that Leela's embodied affects the language. Because she want, he wants to ask questions like, you talk about the fridge, can I fit my hand inside a bread box? Right? Or can I walk through that doorway? And that, in, that requires it's, those kinds of broad questions uh, also bring into questions of, well, what's my, what's my experience of things of certain sizes and my own body size? And again, she can generalize on those, on those, uh, those kinds of rules. Uh, hello, so uh, I have a question. Point of uh, great dispute of this week, actually. That topic is on this week. Um, so in these simulated worlds, so right now Leela runs only in simulation. Okay. And, um, and so the simulations are very deterministic, and they don't exhibit a lot of noise. Um, and there's a couple problems with that. Um, one of which is they don't exhibit a lot of noise, right? So how do you learn, um, how do you adapt to lacks of reliability? Um, and the second thing is they're sort of hyper-rational in the true 1980s AI style. Um, and there's a lot of value, I think we've learned over the past 20 years, there's a lot of value to uh, noise in your reasoner as well. Uh, so we pushed both of those points on our, on our to-do list. Maybe we hire, hire another person. But um, but I think I'll just leave that at that. The answer is, you know, uh, actually, I'll say one more thing. Um, but the nice thing is that ultimately, Leela schemas only make probabilistic assertions about something, right? So you saw a couple of things in these videos, one of which is she made a plan, and the plan failed. And she reasoned about why the plan failed and went around that, right? So if, if there's a lot of noise in the system, um, like, uh, you know, this, this surface is not rigid, right? So sometimes I find surfaces that are not rigid, and sometimes I find chairs where the back is rigid. She will, over time, learn to discriminate from those two cases and correlate them with other factors, like, oh, when I see they have this kind of uh, dull pattern to them or they're 
kind of convex, um, then maybe they're actually this soft, noisy thing, right? With un unpredictable thing, whereas a, a rigid back is predictable. And one of the things that she does is she makes hypotheses. So if, if she if she makes a new schema, like, like I was talking about for Carl, and then she'll immediately, she has a bunch of heuristics. One heuristic is, oh, if something interesting happens, just try to repeat it. Because you might not be in the situation again for a while, so I might want to learn that. Um, but another one is that if, she, if she's got nothing better to do, she, she plays. You saw that. So she may say, well, I know a bunch of things about touching objects that are shiny, but I don't know so much about this. Maybe I'll go do, um, I see one here. I'm going to do a little experiment. She makes a hypothesis, and that hypothesis increases or decreases the probability that her theory is correct. Um, and so I'm, I believe that the answer to the noisy environment lies somewhere in there. But it's an area of research. No, that's a great way. That is a good way to think. The question is if the system, when you, you know, remember every time you control C, Leela, unless the serializer is working, she, she dies, right? She doesn't know anything. So when you reboot her, she doesn't know anything. And so the question is what does she know to start? Okay? So uh, several things. First of all, the physics world that she happens to be plugged in when you start her up gives her her primitive actions and her primitive sensory, uh, sensory inputs. So they define the world, although we can change that. One of the things we, we show is we can change that down the road. Um, so she doesn't have any preconceptions of what her senses are or what her affordances are. Um, the second thing is uh, to put in certain heuristics like this, uh, oh, inverse action. If I did something, undo it and do it again. Right? So we've, we've written a few of those uh, heuristics into the planners, into the planner infrastructure. Um, and um, Clearly, there will be more heuristics to be added, but you want to avoid adding as you want to add as few as you can, but no fewer. Um, the third thing is we tune some things based on some of Piaget's guidance. Like we, she learns a lot. Of, she builds a big corpus before she starts worrying about persistent objects. Why do humans do that? I don't know, but it certainly makes the debugging and the development better, and you still get where you want to go. Um, which is kind of a crappy answer, but you know, again, we're guided by humans. We're not actually trying to slavishly ape them. We'll take one last question here. So does Leela ever forget? And would it be helpful that she forgets? <sighs> Unfortunately, the answer is no. But the unfortunate. The only reason I say that's unfortunate is um, from computer science reason, for, our, for, for um, you know, memory footprint, which right now has not been actually significant. Um, you know, the more, the more candidate schemas you've got, uh, the more of them you have to consider or ignore. And we don't have a frame system yet or anything like that, so you've got to look at everything. Um, but I don't know, do humans forget? Do they? I don't know. Or maybe they just never get around to putting a pointer on it, and you've still dedicated that thing. You know, I mean, you know, why when you're old do you get back all these old memories? Because your memory got scrambled and some pointers got rewritten? I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, in principle, Leela need not forget. But as from a computer science point of view, you really need garbage collection. Uh, but what criteria should you use? You know, I don't know. I mean, humans do another thing, which is that they laboriously learn uh, processes by first uh, principles, like how to walk. But you very rapidly compile subroutines to do them. And then those schemas that you built to learn how to walk when you're 18 months old, do you GC them, or do they just never get called? I don't, I honestly don't know. Um, and uh, I mean, I think you were asking the, the, the philosophical question, does Leela ever forget? Um, you know, the, the, the practical question is, unfortunately, no. Um, but the philosophical question, I, you know, I don't, I don't know in principle. I mean, I think the thing, what really happens is that you increase the levels of abstraction, and so you just spend less time calling this low-level stuff from Leela's point of view, and so 
you could probably saw some of that away um, without major loss of or any loss of functionality. But we're so far away from from that that we don't do that. All right. Well, let's let's thank David one more time. Thank you.